Bill Northcutt is the Alachua County Fire Chief and Director of the Alachua County Fire Rescue Department. He began his career as a firefighter paramedic in 1990 with the Orange County Fire Rescue Department. In 1986, he became a firefighter paramedic for the city of Gainesville, where he distinguished himself and moved up in the ranks, eventually becoming the Fire Chief of the city of Gainesville in 2006. He began his career with Alachua County Fire Rescue in 2010, when he was hired as the Deputy Fire Chief. After the retirement of Chief Ed Bailey in 2014, he became the Alachua County Fire Rescue Chief. He has an Associate of Science degree in Fire Science from Central Florida Community College, an Associate of Arts degree from Santa Fe College, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Eckerd College. He earned the Executive Fire Officer Certificate from the National Fire Academy and the Chief Fire Officer designation from the Center of Public Safety Excellence. Bill is a member of Rotary International, the International Association of Firefighters, and the Florida Fire Chiefs Association. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Nice to be here. So when I was a kid, I wanted to be a firefighter. What did you want to be when you were a kid? I wanted to be a firefighter <laughs> for a long time. And I think the, ad the adrenaline we all feel when we see that truck going down the street with the red lights and so forth, uh, uh, helping people is always a draw in this industry as well. So you, are, you were one of those kids that held on to the dream. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I thought we'd start by just talking to our viewers a little bit about the history of Alachua County Fire Rescue. So when did it start? Alachua County Fire Rescue really it has its origin on the EMS side. We took over ambulance transport in 1974 and operated that system until about 1980, we started in the fire side of the business and operated primarily the city of Alachua. That was one of the big first big contracts we had with several other uh, small stations around the county. And in 1989 was when we really started to expand the organization with the construction of the first urban station that we have, which is Station 19. And then the rest, most of the rest of the construction has been into the urban fringe. Over the last five years, we have uh, taken over response, actually more like seven or eight years, have taken the responsibility of several of the small cities that have joined the Municipal Services Taxing Unit for Fire. And that's the city of Archer was the first, uh, then the city of Waldo, and then the city of Hawthorne uh, that decided to join the, the MSTU. So we've been operating those stations. Uh, the last one, I think, was Waldo joined about six or seven years ago. And just going back to the 70s, so we do ambulance service for the entire county, correct? We do. Uh, We've operated, again, that, the ambulance transport system since 1974, and we are the sole transport provider uh, in the entire county. I understand that, uh, you know, not only do we have a relatively new fire chief since uh, Chief Bailey retired, but I, I understand there's been some, uh, a lot of movement in leadership in general. Can you tell us about that? There has been, as you can imagine, with any promotion, uh, since the manager chose to promote from within and uh, felt that the direction the organization was going was a good one. It would have been certainly the, his opportunity to uh, find a chief from another department if they wanted the direction to change. And with that, created some vacancies. And so uh, we were able to identify an internal candidate to replace me in my position, Chief Theus, who has uh, 20 years with Alachua County Fire Rescue. And it, with his promotion then created that vacancy. And through a real competitive process, we had several candidates in-house in that would have been good good solid candidates, uh, but we had found someone from Brevard County, uh, Jeff Taylor, who joined us and uh, has actually just been on the job for a few weeks now and seems to really be hitting the ground running with managing the EMS program. Well, I know Chief Theus was in, in charge for a little while while you were gone recently. He did a great job. Oh, well, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's good at what he does. Uh, 
A lot of press lately and a lot of public discussion about ambulance service, and I know that uh, you and the county manager had long discussions leading into the budget process, and uh, we've, we've got some improvements coming on the rescue side. Can you tell us about that? We do. The health care, pre-hospital health care, has really been an evolution over the years. Uh, we and the fire rescue business have been in this business for really since the 70s nationwide. The federal government started investing heavy dollars back in the 70s. And for many years as the pre-hospital transport and health care in general, we got fairly used to, it was primarily how many citizens you have, you can fairly do a fairly good prediction on how many transports you will have. And over the years with the complexity of health care, with more and more people not using a physician necessarily, but they use the emergency room as their health care provider. Sometimes they don't get the continued uh, general health uh, direction from a physician. So they wait until things get very bad. And so then they really start to impact the system. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I think we have an aging population. I think it's fair to say that the older we get, I think studies show that the uh, in the last five years or 10 years of our life, and we spend 80% of our health care dollars. Right. And so, uh, so we have really started to mushroom the number of responses that we have. In our community in particular, add Shan's Health Network. Right. Uh, we are a regional magnet for very sick people that can't be taken care of in their local jurisdictions. They are transported here to be stabilized. And then they very often don't go home. They go back to a local hospital that can then take care of their health needs. And so the uh, impact on our transport division has really started to mushroom over the last five or six years. The last transport we added was in 2005. Uh, since then, our call load has increased well over 20%. As I recall, last we looked at it, it was about 24 25% since then. And it's really put a lot of pressure on us. As part of our proposal uh, to the manager, uh, we are proposing a peak load division. Very often you can watch the call load by time of day. And so we are really getting to a point where don't, we don't need to add many more 24-hour rescues. So what we have proposed is a 13-hour uh, trucks that will, we will add, be adding three of those this next year. Uh, the plan will be for them to operate six days a week, which are the busiest six days. Sunday is typically a lower call load day than the rest of the week. And those units are being paid for by the anticipated revenue, not only that they will generate themselves, but over the years, as we have budgeted, as the managers have budgeted, they haven't used all of the uh, projected collections because we do bill for services. We generate over $8 million a year in revenue for our rescue division. And they hadn't budget, budgeted uh, as much as they could have. So Dr. Niblock, in looking at that, uh, we're upping the uh, better predict, basically use what we know we're going to collect, right. uh, and then use the added revenue that we anticipate from the expansion of this, or the addition, quite frankly, this is in a, a new division that we're adding right. to address these responses that we're having. Let's, uh, you've, you've got a very large department and you've got so many different facets, so let's, let's jump around a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of conversation and a lot of attention paid to the ISO uh, classifications or ratings, and some very, really good news about uh, the hauled water certification. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. There is. With the acceptance of the SAFER Act, about a year and a half ago, we were awarded a federal grant from, the, uh, from FEMA, an Assistance to Firefighters SAFER Act grant that, stat that funded enough staff to increase our staffing in our rural stations, the Archer, Waldo, and Hawthorne Station, from two people, which had been our historical staffing level, to four, uh, which does several things. One, it's a, it's a safer staffing level for not only our members, we can actually work. State law requires that we have four people on scene before we fight fire. But it also allowed us to redeploy our tankers. Our tankers had been more in the suburban areas, in the urban cluster areas, that had the staffing available to respond with the tanker. Mm -hmm. 
with that redeployment of those tankers, it put them closer to the areas where the properties don't, are not protected by fire hydrants. So the insurance service office who rates us, that's what helps drive many of the insurance premium rates. Not all insurance companies sign on to them, but the majority do. That they allow a department that can demonstrate that they can pump 250 gallons of water a minute for two hours, uninterrupted, that they recognize that department as not needing fire hydrants to be able to effectively fight fire. Right. We were able to achieve that certification, and what that is going to do is there are over 6,400 parcels, so over 6,400, now that's improved parcels, that's with a structure, a structure on it that uh, we use the property appraisers database. So it is has a structure that is being taxed by the property appraiser that will now benefit their previous ISO class because they were within five miles of a county operated fire station, but they were not within a thousand feet of a fire hydrant. They were rated as an ISO class nine. ISO rates from one to 10, 10 being the worst, one being the best. We are an ISO class three locally. So they were going from a class nine. Now with this hauled water certification, they will get an ISO class three. We've been working with an insurance company locally who was willing to run some scenarios on actual policies. If plugging in the only change would be the ISO rating and discovered that would be at least 20% savings on the homeowner's insurance policies for all of these individuals. That's significant. Now, we think so. Uh, and so we also recently discovered that those unincorporated area residents that are protected by a couple of our partner departments will also, if they're in the unincorporated area, will also be able to benefit from the class three rating, uh, independent, again, of their fire, uh, location to a fire hydrant. So do you recommend that people get in touch with their insurance adjuster and just say, okay, given this new information, what has that done to my policy? Or? That would help us, and we would like to hear back what the insurance savings is, because it's difficult for the board sometimes, or the manager, to recommend spending additional taxpayer funds without some tangible benefit, and that will really help us quantify specific examples. We do have the research done by the insurance company for us, uh, but it would really be nice to hear from, from, from some citizens. Now this new ISO class goes into effect October 1 of this year. So if anyone renews between now and October 1st, they will, will not see the improvement. Uh, anyone who renews after October 1st that is in this, what I refer to as the gap area, they are within five miles of an Alachua County operated fire station, and they are not within a thousand feet of a fire hydrant. If their agent, uh, if the, the premium calculation does not show they are an ISO class three, they need to question their agent because we can certainly provide them the documentation from the ISO that shows our new classification. You, you mentioned a little while ago that you know, not only do we cover the unincorporated area with our uh, fire service, but that uh, we also have fire delivery agreements, fire service delivery agreements. I know that over time those can change, but right now, kind of what is the, the status at this moment in time of our fire service agreements? One of the benefits that people have in living in Alachua County in general, whether they live in the city of Gainesville, Newberry, High Springs, or any of the other small cities, is that they benefit from the fire services network that, w that has been put together. It's been in place for a number of years. When a call comes into 911, there is, it does not matter what jurisdiction they are in. The, the center dispatches all emergency fire rescue calls. The same dispatchers are dispatching all of the different departments. So the, the computer calculates, it doesn't matter which department, it looks at which is the fastest, which would be the fastest responding resource and dispatches it. We've had a, an agreement with the city of Gainesville. It's had several different versions over the years. Uh, the current one has a, it's a fairly simple formula in calculating what our reimbursement back and forth is, but there is an economic arrangement based on the numbers of responses that we do into each other's area. We have specific contracts with all of the other towns and uh, some of the volunteer departments and so forth 
for their responses to the areas around their towns. And those contracts have worked very well. Uh, we certainly have a, uh, they've been good partners. Uh, they've been good partners through the downturns. You know, when we were all cutting back, they, right. they also uh, helped us as well. And so uh, the next few years, I think that the board will be uh, addressing some of those fire service issues because some of those need to be may need to be adjusted. So I know over the next, over the coming year, that's going to be one of our responsibilities is really to look at those closely and make sure that our reimbursements are where they should be. I know that the uh, E911 division is uh, under your command as well. Uh, tell us what those folks do. E911 is the group that work, that controls the mapping and addressing throughout the county. and They were established to make sure that the emergency responders could find all of the locations within the given counties. Their total budget is funded through the fees that all of the citizens pay on their phone lines. They pay them on their cell phones, their landlines. Uh, currently, it's a 40 cent per line fee. Uh, that went down from 50 cents over the, over the years. And all of their funding comes from that. They do not get any of the ad valorem or any of the MSTU tax funding uh, from the county. That comes from the tax on cell phones or cable TV, the communication services tax? Is that where that comes it from? It actually is not. The communication, oh. that is separate. Oh, okay. If you look on your phone line, there is an E911 That's charge. Right. That's right. And that E911 charge is what comes back to the local jurisdictions. And what is SMART 911? Smart 911 is a system that we're real excited about. It's a fairly new system within the last couple of years. And what that does is it allows the citizens to put into a central database any pertinent information about themselves. Very often we get to a, a rescue call and the person that is ill may not be able to help us well. They can put in any medicines that they are on. Is th if there is anything unique about finding their house, they can put that in there. And this is a national database. It is secure, so they shouldn't be concerned about the security of any information that they put in there. And if the individual who is, has a Smart 911 account, if they call from any of the phones that are listed in the Smart 911 system, that th it will reach out, the local communication center, 911 center, will reach out to this database and see if it has this phone number. And if it does, it will download, it will move any of the pertinent information so that the 911 call taker can see anything specific that this person has had entered. And then that responder knows in advance what they're going into and what the specific medical conditions may be. Exactly. And very often, especially in the rural areas, there can be some unique ways to find people's houses. And that does allow the responders to get those specific instructions on how to find that location. As you know, you and I both know around here, some of these roads that uh, we may call streets are dirt trails. They're not very big. They're, they're considered private roads, right. uh, but can be difficult to find homes on there because of big lots and so on. And so this particular system also follows the individual across the country. If the particular 911 center that picks up their, their call for help is also a part of the SMART 911 group, it will reach out and pull that information down so that, again, the responders, they could be at a restaurant, they will have any per pertinent medical conditions, have that information to be prepared when they arrive. Another division you have is the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, or the Emergency Management uh, Division. And uh, we haven't had an activation lately. Uh, been real fortunate. There's a hurricane out in the, uh, in the ocean uh, that I'm keeping an eye on right now. But uh, tell us about the Emergency Management Division and its responsibilities. Yeah, emergency Management, their responsibility is a statute-driven responsibility that in a disaster, they coordinate all of the resource needs. When we exceed our resource capacity and we need help, they are the ones that reach out to the state agencies that then reach out to the federal agencies and pull in the appropriate resources that have been requested. Uh, the emergency 
uh, management division uh, has worked also to uh, improve the communication back in the community. In particular, uh, Code Red is one of the things that they have recently implemented. I say recently, it actually has been several years now. I, I got a Code Red alert just yesterday, I think, when a thunderstorm was rolling through. Exactly. And anyone who, now this is also an opt-in. You have to right. call and set up an account. And if you want to be notified of different disasters and different events that are coming, uh, you can sign up and you can set how you are notified, uh, what you are notified for, in your case, the the uh, storms rolling in. Uh, if there, uh, there are other options as well that individuals can opt in for. When I was hired on in 2004, we had four storms come very shortly after I was hired, so I got to learn about the Emergency Operations Center. It's a pretty impressive facility. Um, it is. The, the EOC is set up so that all of the probable resource needs, each of those sections is represented. Public works, as you can imagine, we often think of public works as uh, maintaining right-of-ways and maybe roads and that type thing. But in 2004, uh, we responded with a team of public works, because public works has the heavy equipment that none of right. the rest of us have. Right. And you can imagine clearing streets in an area that is so full of trees, like our county is, that uh, we put a team together that had public works members, law enforcement, and fire rescue to clear the roads so that the primary function, quite frankly, is to clear the hospital routes. Right. So those major routes getting to and from hospitals are cleared first, and then you take the feeder roads and then the ancillary roads and the neighborhood roads kind of all through the system. But the uh, all of the neighborhood or community representatives are there, law enforcement, fire rescue, uh, uh, just all of those, so that when we do activate that, it is a 24-hour operation if it gets to that level of activation, and like it was in 2004. It was impressive, a uh, very, very impressive organizational structure and effectiveness. Uh, I know that you all have a CERT program, too, uh, and that's a very important way citizens can get involved with the county. It is. Often in a disaster, it is difficult. We exceed our capacity of responders very quickly, and we really do need the community to be able to take care of themselves and their neighbors until we can get help there. Right. And the Citizens Emergency Response Team covers a number of those types of, of training needs. They do fire extinguisher training as part of that. They do some of the basic first aid as part of that. And really, it's at a basic level, but really help people sustain their neighborhoods until uh, the rest of the responders can get there. And in some cases, it's the 72 hours, because the federal government makes it very clear, we don't expect them to get here for 72 hours. So our community must be self-sustaining for that long. Chief, I, I know it's been a very high priority of yours to uh, diversify your staff, and you've made some very concerted efforts in recruiting to uh, make sure that minorities and women uh, are understanding the opportunities that are available. Uh, tell us about your recruiting efforts. As a little history, as you can imagine, for many years, this has been a white male dominated industry hundreds of years of tradition in the industry and so forth. And it's Im certainly important to us that our all of our responders look like our community, that we have the mix, that we, we really offer those opportunities to everybody. And we, about a year ago, it, you know, as you can imagine, it's difficult with the budget cuts we had and so forth, that we really have had to streamline a lot of things. And unfortunately, these things that are not emergency response fall off of the plate first. And we recently had one of our lieutenants agree to take on that as a side project, not something that would be required, but something that she's passionate about as well. Right. And we've established a recruitment team that is has begun reaching out more into the schools. It's difficult for us to recruit someone that's in their 20s who wants to change a career because of the cost. Uh, it is. Uh, for us to send someone through school who just wants to change a career. Now, I, we, I support, well, I hope that we are able to get there. I've been part of organizations that have done that over time, and we did that at one time when 
when we had the resources. Right. Because it's we do prefer to find people who have uh, got some life experience. It make, makes them a little bit easier. It makes them a little bit uh, good transition for them. Right. But we have started reaching out into the schools because we want young people. Uh, we have actually started reaching out and visiting the elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Getting them early. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that, like, as you and I, when we were very young, kind of look at that in awe, and we want all of the community to recognize that, hey, that is an option for me. We, we uh, sent a camera crew over to the Lofton Center, where I know you have a very good program there that includes uh, a couple of trailers or shipping containers that you've turned into burn houses. Uh, but it was amazing to watch those young people mm -hmm. respond to the firefighters and the training. How, how did that evolve? That was one of the things that was really the brainchild of a couple of our training captains. And those boxes that you see, those are our old retired shipping containers. The same containers you see going up the highway on the back of semi trucks that then they pick up and put on a, uh, on a semi. Mm -hmm. They are, we worked with the school board. It's a great partnership with the school board. We started a number of years ago with the fire and emergency medical magnet program. Mm -hmm. And it has just blossomed from there. That's the young folks that you mentioned. They are actual students in the fire and emergency services magnet program. And, but that, uh, the school board was excited about getting that resource out there because that adds that dimension that those students really need to see. For us, it provided us a location. That entire facility cost us the cost of the shipping containers. I believe that now we have about seven containers involved in this. Uh, as of next year, we're looking, right now it's a two-story structure looking to go to a three-story structure. So for the cost of about $2,500 per container, we have a three-story training structure that we use one of the boxes as a burn box so that fires are lit in there so that it gets hot and smoky in the rest of the facility without worrying about transferring the fire there. Uh, and it's built so that that one piece, when it degrades, can certainly be just cut off and, and a new one put on. But it's been real exciting. It's been an addition for us that we didn't have. And so for our own members, it has been a, an element of hands-on training that we've needed for a number of years. And it has added that exciting benefit for, for the students. The students don't want to sit in the classroom all the time. They want right. to get their hands dirty. Well, Chief, I, I still want to be a firefighter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for all you do and all you, the men and women that work with you. Thank you for what you do to keep us safe. Absolutely. Hey, all the smoke alarms are here tonight. I just want to say a couple of things about old Hal here. Let's remember, he's a hero and saved this house and family when he spotted that kitchen fire. You've had a good 10 years. We'll miss you, Hal. Hey, it's Hal's replacement. Check out that new technology. Here, kid. You'll need a fresh one of these. Rookie. Remember to replace any smoke alarm older than 10 years and replace the batteries in your alarms every year.